Hi, I'm Valerie Wilson, and I'm very happy to be here today. And uh, congratulations on making it this far. I'm assuming that uh, since you're here uh, or uh, you know joining us virtually, that you uh, have something to sell. And so that's a pretty exciting place to be. And uh, you know, kudos to you. Well done. It's a very, very tough battle to get through the invention process and the packaging process and UPC process and all of that. And now your battle is, how do you grow your sales? So what I'm here to talk to you about is the, uh, you know, the data that's involved in growing sales. You know, it, a lot of this is relationship driven, but um, we're in a fact-based sales world. We're in a world of big data. Data's everywhere. And um, what my company does is we collect uh, UPC uh, scanned and then also panel reported uh, data. So that we have a panel of about 100,000 people. And um, so those panelists report what they buy. We call them the why behind the buy uh, because they tell us what motivated them to buy the products. And then we also know a little bit about them. Uh, then the, uh, the point of sale side of our business, we collect data from uh, retailers all around the world actually. And uh, so the scans, the UPC scans are picked up and beamed up to a database. And so then it's the blend of the point of sale data and then also the panel data uh, that tells us really what's buying, what people are buying, for what price, where they bought it, if it was on deal, all that kind of thing. And then we also know then from the why behind the buy side of the business, uh, you know, what, uh, a little bit more about who is buying the product and uh, maybe what incented them to buy the product more than just a price reduction. You know, so was it on feature, was it on display, those kinds of things. So between that blend of data, uh, there's a lot of data, um, a lot of numbers, and we'll go through what some of the numbers mean. But, but all of that information then goes into a buyer deciding whether or not they're going to keep a product on the shelf. All right, but the first battle is then how do you even get your product on the shelf? You have to sell it in. And so with a small, with a, a small company, you know, an entrepreneur, um, a lot of times your battle is how do I find, you know, I, I don't have data. Or how do I convince my buyer, you know, to pick up my product up and take a gamble in the first place. So I'm going to talk you through just some of the uh, places you can find information to build your sales story. Uh, but first, I'm going to take you through then the actual metrics that you need to be aware of whenever you're selling in your product. Remember, the main thing is fact-based sales. That's very important. You have to have the facts. Uh, you know, it's, it's great that you're nice folks and that you have a really sexy package, but the main thing is the buyer needs a return on the investment, needs to have a reason for you to be on the shelf. All right, so, uh, you know, I love this uh, graphic because this is, you know, kind of like an aerial view of a store, but... What I love about this is, you know, there are millions of UPCs out there. And so when you walk into a store and you see an item on the shelf, the competitive set is huge. Huge. You know this, right? You have your UPC. So you have to think about what differentiates me from my competitive set. All right, so some of the things that we look at uh, in this world have to do with the category, you know, the category uh, goals, if you will. So there's a classic process called category management, and it starts with a category definition, and it goes on through what the role of the category is, and you know, is this a destination driver category? Is this a you know new and wow category? Is this a staple category? Those kinds of things. So all of this goes into the category management process, and the bottom line of it is, is that it uses a heck of a lot of numbers. So remember I said this is fact-based sales. There are a lot of numbers that go into this little wheel right up here. All right, so you have to play within that scope, all right? You've got to know what your category is. It's bigger than your product. What is the goal of you being on the aisle, gaining place on the shelf? Where do you fit in that space? So then, based on that, you kind of build your story. This is how I'm different. This is the goal of my category. And this is how I'm going to help you grow sales in your category. And it fits within the scope of this category management piece. Now, getting your product on the shelf, there are some, uh, some key numbers to keep in mind. Uh, the data that we collect, though, it comes from, as I mentioned, we have uh, POS. We have household panel. 
uh, yeah, so we have uh, sales by store by week that are UPC. Uh, we also have then feature and display, which is causal data. And then we have the household panel purchases. So as you think through then the products that you buy, you know, think of it in terms of I have the actual facts of what's selling where, but then the panel side of it is the why behind the buy. Right? So those are two kind of divides, if you will, of why are people buying your product as well as the sales performance. There are some key performance measures to keep in, uh, keep in mind. So the fact-based sales piece uh, comes from just these facts. Any retailer is going to want to understand in-stock numbers, margin, inventory, sales, and turns. And so you as a new, uh, uh, product, uh, a new product on the shelf, your retailer probably has its own data set. One of the things about Walmart is that they have a massive database, and whenever you are selling product to them, you do get access to your product sales by store, by day, uh, even by day part. The data is extensive. So if you do sell in a product specifically to Walmart, but Kroger, Target, any of those, Walgreens, they all have database, uh, databases for you to tap into. So you're going to need somebody uh, helping you who understands how to crunch through numbers. All right, so that's, that's critical. That would be, I would say, uh, you know, your first business partner needs to be, well, you need, you know, a lot of things, but you do need somebody who's going to be savvy with how to build out the databases and build out the reporting. All right, so these main metrics uh, are what any buyer is going to use then to determine whether or not you are on the shelf versus something that's a like product. All right, so first of all, sales, of course, that's critically important. How are you selling? And that's just the dollars collected at the, uh, at the register. All right, and then your total sales are your dollars. So what were you sold? What was the, you know, the dollar price rolling across the, uh, sorry, across the scanner? And then how many units did you sell? The math is really very simple. All right, so key to note, it's the selling price, okay? It's not the price you sell it to the retailer, all right? That's their cost. All right, this is the sales price. All right, so that then determines sales. Now, one and a half is sales velocity. So it's not just about uh, whether or not, you know, you're selling the most. And the example that I like to bring up, I have up here this little Jello cup, and this is an actual true story of a product that was in South Florida. You know, if you're, you being a small manufacturer, you're thinking, well, how am I going to compete against the giants in my category? Well, this uh, Jello cup here, uh, there is a, a woman in, um, I think she was based in Miami. Her name was Lulu, and she started producing these Jello snacks uh, in her kitchen, and they were tremendously successful. Now, if you're competing against a major corporation that also makes Jello snacks, and I won't tell you what company I worked for at the time, but they're a big name, big, huge name in this. They sell millions and millions and millions of units of this product, right? So whenever you're just analyzing the numbers and you're looking at overall sales, you would never see this product show up because it only had distribution in a few stores in South Florida, all right? So how does a product like this go national? Well, you need to pay attention to something called sales velocity. So sales velocity is looking at your sales, so the slide before, right? So how, what was the sales price? How many units did you sell? Right, so that's your sales. How many stores is that product in? And then your weekly movement, okay? So sales velocity is a, a, a measure of speed, if you will, through the store, all right? So the reason this is important is because this product here was selling about 10 to 1 what that major brand was selling in the stores. Only about five to 10 stores at the time, but 10 to one whenever we looked at sales velocity because we had to break it down by the number of stores that it was selling in. And so, th so then what we were able to do to build this category story was we looked at other stores similar to this from a demographic standpoint. And you know, Florida, uh, I mean, note the coloration here. This is a very popular product among Hispanic consumers. Well, where do Hispanics live, all right? Not just South Florida. They live everywhere, right? And also, they're highly concentrated in Texas, California, all over the United States. 
So whenever you then multiply that by where are all of the stores where we can sell this product, this product, well, Lulu had problems with how am I going to keep up with demand, right? So she had to, there were a lot of financing things that had to go on and a factory had to be built and all this kind of stuff. But this is a tremendous success story then and a lot of it hinged on sales velocity. So it's not just you versus the giants. You have to be smart about how you're approaching. I'm important in these stores and there are more stores like this in the United States. And so that's the product. That's the way that you need to pitch that. Metric number two is inventory. All right, so you have to be very conscious of the inventory that remains in the store because that's essentially what the buyer owes. The buyer only has a certain open to buy amount, and so they can't just buy infinite anything that they want. You know, they have an open to buy that they have to manage against, and they have to watch their inventory levels. So they've got to look at the inventory dollars, typically, that is the cost and then the units owned, and then they look at, you know, the different levels across the stores, and then that determines how much more they can ship in. So keeping track of your inventory is critically important. Margin, so this is how much we take to the bank. So the dollars, so, you know, you've got your cost, you have the price at which you sell, that in between is the margin. Margin is very important to the buyer because that's their profit. It's another way of saying profit. You understand margin, but the buyer this is very important because you, it may come between you and your competitive product being on or off the shelf. Well, they're going to start talking to you about margin. Can you give me a few more pennies per case or per unit, that kind of thing, so that then if you're more lucrative for them to keep on the shelf, they'll keep you on the shelf. So margin always comes into play. All right, number four, in stock percent. So, you know, I talked about inventory, but in stock is very important. Are you able to supply those stores? Because you may have a great product, but if there's a chasm open on the shelf because you can't supply the product, that's going to be a problem. So you have to make sure that in this expanded distribution, right, so, you know, maybe you have a great product, but if you can't keep it on the shelf, that's a scorecard metric that's going to go against you, all right? So this is another key critical uh, metric that the buyers use. You got to be on the shelf. All right, and then finally, retail turns. This is another speed measure, and so how quickly am I turning your product on the shelf? Because that applies directly to sales and margin and all of those other uh, performance metrics that we talked about before. All right, so these are five very basic metrics. There's a lot more, but of the basics, these are the most important. And so you need to pay attention to these things. Make sure that you've got somebody on your staff who understands how to crunch these numbers. The math is very simple. It's retail. It's not rocket science. So, you know, it, it, the, the um, formulas are available, you know, readily available on the Internet. If you're not a math person, uh, you can, you know, it, it's really pretty simple. All right, it's like less than fourth grade math. So you can wrap your head around this kind of thing, but the problem is the data can get very large. You know, lots of rows of data. There's plenty of stuff to analyze. So just, you know, be careful with that. All right, so this is kind of, uh, you know, boring stuff, right? Uh, make sure that you're <laughs> awake by this point in time. You know, I, I know that, you know, most of you are probably creative types. Uh, you know, you've, uh, you, you're inventors and, you know, you're package designers and this kind of thing. And the numbers piece of the business may be the last thing that you want to think about. But you've got to think about it. Now that you have a UPC, you've got to get a return on your investment. And you have to be smart about where you put your product and how much it's selling for and all of that stuff that I've already mentioned. All right, so that's once you get your product into the stores, you have uh, metrics like this. Now what's next? Whenever you are selling more of your product, fact-based sales, you know, hopefully this is you because you're growing your business, right? You've got to sell more product in more places, and you make more money, and it's a wonderful thing. Hopefully this is you with your, you know, having a party once uh, you get more distribution in your products. All right, so just real quickly, where, does the number, where do the numbers come from? So specifically at Walmart, there's a thing called Retail Link. That's a database that uh, holds a lot of information. And so, for example, at Walmart, uh, the store sales beam up to this thing called Retail Link. And then um, Retail Link is available to anyone selling product. Uh, you can see your own product. When you're a category manager, you can see the competitive products too. 
and that's the assistance that Walmart gets um, through category management. Uh, but if you sell product, you can see your sales within Retail Link. All right, then as well as that, other retailers, uh, competitive retailers, so Kroger, Dollar General, Publix, Walmart as well, all of the retail landscape then also sells uh, their data. Not every store, but most of them sell their product, uh, sorry, sell their data to IRI and to Nielsen, and then there are a few others, NPD. It depends on the product that you're selling. But for most of your consumer packaged goods, products in uh, food and uh, over-the-counter and beauty and uh, consumables, those are household goods, that kind of thing, that data then uh, is going into IRI and Nielsen. So the data loads in and retailers use this data then to understand how they are competing against others. It doesn't mean that Kroger can necessarily see Walmart's data and so on, but Kroger can understand its performance versus the rest of the market. Right, so that's kind of how that works. Is it's a, you know, the scans go someplace, the scans go up to a database, Walmart specifically is Retail Link, and then beyond that, there are other aggregation databases like IRIs and Nielsen's that collect others. And then we look at the competitive uh, place. And we find things then like your product versus other products. Maybe there's opportunities there to grow sales. Right? So that's just very briefly, very broadly how that works. All right, so it's not just the giants, you know, we have, uh, we collect data from Schnucks and Wegmans and uh, Shaw's and, you know, this landscape gets very, very large. When I talked about big data, when you hear about big data, big data is everywhere and in retail, whenever you think of the millions of UPCs and the many, many retailers and the thousands and thousands of doors that are open across the United States, that's what big data means. It's a, there's a lot of data. Now, if you don't have access, the data sources that I just told you about, Nielsen and IRI and NPD and others, it, there is a cost to buying that data set. So the syndicated data pool costs you money, and it can be very costly. You don't have to have this data to survive. You need to have specifically your retailer data, and then you also have to have the trust that your category managers are uh, doing the right thing by the category and making sure that they're analyzing you know, your sales versus the competitive set accurately uh, and fairly. And they should be. That is, you know, that's the, uh, uh, you know, if you will, that's just the agreement. That's the word I'm looking for. That's the agreement between the category manager and the retailer, is that the category manager is managing the category over and above the brands that they sell. All right, so you don't have to have access then to the Nielsen and the IRI data. It's costly, but if you can get it and if you have a number cruncher, it is a good ROI for you just so that you can really keep track of what's going on in the marketplace. If you don't have access to this data, there's a lot of other places where you can dig into consumer insights on your own, and one of the best resources is Google. Uh, there's also then uh, free resources out there from Cannondale, Harvard, Cantar, Bloomberg. Uh, the U.S. Census, if you have a product that has a certain demographic group that goes after it, um, the U.S. Census has a lot of data. If you have a, a weather-driven product, NOAA is a great place to go. If you have a product that uh, has to do with uh, health and wellness, the CDC has a lot of data that can be downloaded and crunched. So, you know, you again, this resource that I talked about, someone who can manage the data, somebody who can get in there to these databases and then make them come alive and tell stories, they, they're called data scientists and uh, it's kind of the, you know, it's all the rage in the marketplace right now, all right? So, these people, there's a reason why, if they're good, they do command nice salaries, and there's a lot of them out there that are freelance, and they are worth their money. And they can, you know, scrape these sites, and they can come up with stories then to say, hey, you know, I know that my product tends to sell, uh, you know, to women over the age of 40 who have kids, who drive minivans, who live in the Midwest, and that kind of thing. And then the state of scientists should be able to at least tell you then, you know, where those people are. And then you can talk to your buyer about, you know, hey, I know that I have a lot of people in this area of the country who uh, 
buy my product, and so why don't we try my, why don't we try me there? And you don't have to, that can be free, except for the cost of the resource. And if you're able to do that work, then, you know, that's even better. Right, but you need to be conscious of the, what moves your product. Is it a certain person that's buying it overlaid with that? Is it a weather trend overlaid with that? Is it like a, you know, an illness cycle that causes your product to be bought? What is it? And then chances are, online, there's going to be some kind of major data source out there. As well as that, there are probably articles that are written, you know, so just Google journalism is what we call it. You get out there and you ask questions of Google and then, you know, you'll find all kinds of information. And that's valid to the retailer. They look at that kind of stuff. It, don't feel like, you know, just because you don't have, you're not throwing down a lot of money on these major databases and, you know, you don't have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, data at your disposal that you can't tell a good story because that is not true. There's a lot of great information out there that can help push your product if you just know who's buying it in the first place. Now, if you're using internet sources, here's a, a, a key thing to keep in mind. Um, you need to make sure that you validate that source. So, um, you know, if you're using blogs, uh, <laughs> be, you know, be careful with that. Social media, be careful with that. You know, try to make sure that you vet it. Uh, but there is a lot of really good information out there. You just have to, when it's coming off the internet, you have to be real careful with where you got it. But if it's a trusted source, you know, Bloomberg or the CDC or the Census Bureau, you know, there's no worries with that. That data is as good as anybody else can get, too. All right, but do vet your sources and then make sure that you reference your sources whenever you're telling your story uh, to your buyer. All right, now, finally, one question is, okay, that's great, but how do I even know at first who is buying my product? You know, I have a website or something like that, and I, I receive orders in, but I just don't know anything about, you know, who's actually buying my product. Sure, I, you know, maybe, maybe you're data savvy and you could get into the uh, Census Bureau site and find out where these people are, but the question is, how do I even know who they are to begin with? All I receive are, you know, orders and I know where I'm shipping my product to, but that's really about it. A survey, uh, you know, that's an easy thing for you to do. I bought a product um, online the other day. Uh, it was a cell phone case um, out of Iowa. Really great case. It was wood and, um, you know, it was like puzzle pieces. Anyway, it's, it's awesome. Love it. Small company, started by a bunch of college kids and um, I was very impressed with what they sent with uh, the cell phone case. It was a questionnaire and, you know, asked me, hey, please, you know, we're a struggling, you know, startup business and would you take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself? Happy to do it. I, I love to help out something like that. And so I sent it back in and it was already addressed. It didn't cost me anything except for the effort to put it in the mailbox. That's it. So don't be afraid of getting surveys. Uh, you know, that's the, really the first step is who's buying your product. Send out surveys with your product. If, you're, uh, if your distribution network right now is the state fairs or, you know, craft fairs or something like that, you know, yes, you can physically see who's buying your product, but, you know, have those little survey cards handy. There's also something on the web called SurveyMonkey. That's a free survey site. It's not too terribly difficult to use. So if you're receiving orders online, you have an email address, just shoot that dude right back out. It doesn't hurt to ask. The worst thing that's going to happen is you get no response. But just keep in mind that it only takes 30 uh, surveys, really, to be statistically significant. That's a shockingly low number. So my recommendation is start with the survey. And have your people love to talk about what they love about your product. And they also love to tell you what they don't love about your product. Or don't be afraid of that. Get that information, find out who's telling you this, and then that's your building block for who is buying your product and where you go from there. And how do you get it in distribution in other places where there are people like that buying the product? And then that builds your story. And you get it into more stores, you get access to more data, then you're into fact-based sales, and then boom, and boom, and boom, you keep growing your business that way. But I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough the power of the survey. Very important vehicle for you to use, and really, it's a postage stamp. That's the cost to you. So this is very cheap, 
and very good information that you get back from your people who are buying your product. All right, so beyond that, um, good luck to you. You know, entrepreneurs are the people who, you know, dare to do what others only, uh, you know, kind of think about. So um, the fact that you're here really speaks a lot about the mission, you know, the uh, achievements that you've already made, and then, you know, potentially where you're going to go from here. It's an exciting time for you, but the fact that you're here means that you're probably at a point where you're going to need to think about the data piece of your business. You've got to use fact-based sales to sell your product, and there's a number of ways to do that. Survey, internet, lots of free sources out there. Get out there, do your own Google journalism, do the research yourself, build those stories, Use the data that you have available through your retailers. Use your own sales data. All of that is valid, but you do need to walk in there with sound sales information in order to justify where you sit on the shelf.